Uh, at Science World, the exhibit where you're uh, turning the bicycle wheels, you throw the lamp on and it's harder to do, isn't that true? So how many said that if you turn the lamp on, your bicycle will slow down? Not so many. Look how many people didn't say that. Conservation of energy, gang. If you're going to light up the lamp, then you're not going uh, to not going to go as far. In fact, if you're ever in your car and your brakes fail, what do you do? Put the lights on. That's right. Skid to a stop. Put the lights on. Put the radio on. Put it on high volume. All right. This yes, yes, car will skid to a stop. Not skid to a stop. How many people got that correct? Is there anyone in here who didn't do it? Oh! Jose, you! Jose, stand up and tell us, tell us why you elected not to do the homework today. Just stand up and tell everyone why you did. Hey, this is the technique I use. I mean, you can really get everyone. <laughs> now, the next question is, a, is probably the most important question in the book. If we're teaching and if we're new at teaching, there are a lot of things we don't know. And by golly, you guys know that where we learn our content is when we're teaching it. That's true of me. I'm sure that's true of you. But there's some place you've got to start off and have the idea correct. And as I guess if there's one little, one little item that you ought to, ought to know is that there's no way that you can violate the law of the conservation of energy. Not in this day and age. And when that's violated, then we got a whole new, whole new ball game. And so uh, <clears throat> you can't get more energy out than you put in. And if you look at your neighbor's paper, your neighbor's paper will say that. With a transformer, you can increase the voltage. With a lever, you can increase the force. With a lever, you can increase the distance. With a transformer, you can increase the current. But by golly, you can't increase the voltage and the current at the same time, no more than you can increase the force and the distance at the same time with a lever. So we all have on there, no way, baby, right? N -wave, N -N -W -B or NWH, as the case may be. Did we all get that right? Good. I'll tell you, if your students leave your course not knowing that, and all the detail and the problem solving and the transposing of equations and getting the squares and the cosines right is for nil. Because they've got to leave with something. And, and there's a good deal of people in the general public believe that you can violate the conservation of energy. In fact, there are, there are places, maybe still going now in Texas, that are selling stock to stockholders for these machines, which with a little energy in, will put out more energy than is being taken in. They're in a stage of development, and they can only develop it with funds. And the oil companies are against this. The power companies are against this. You, we all know there's a great conspiracy out there that the world would be a better place if everyone wasn't conspiring against us. And so if you will all donate a little bit of your funds, we can come in here and save the world. And this is an energy-producing machine that will start off with a little bit and give a lot out. So how many want to buy some stock? Now, <laughs> everyone that wants to buy some stock, stand up. I want to see what you look like. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's be sure we teach that concept. There's no free lunch. No free lunch. OK, now there's another uh, misconception that people have. And it's very, very rampant today. You remember when uh, automobiles first came out? And they were powered with gasoline. Gasoline, explosive a little bit or a lot? Answer begins with a? Yeah. How about gasoline taking the, a gasoline powered engine taking the place of a wagon? Would you want to have a gasoline powered vehicle parked near your children where they sleep? and having that gas tank and below that touch it with a match and it would blow up. And then there was a great phobia also against uh, electricity when electricity first came out. Do you know electricity can kill? Would you want your home wi with those kind of wires in there? Isn't it better to use whale oil, natural? You want to read at night, you burn your whale oil. What do we have the whaling industry for? Because the whole industry depending on this. And people are talking about electric wires in our homes. I think we ought to form a citizens committee and see if we can put a stop to this before it goes too far. Okay? 
And what's the current phobia today? Nuclear. nuclear. Anything nuclear. Or, uh, or radioactivity, that's, 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 that's the R word. And Peter, what did, you, what did your daughter say when I said you can't use the R word? Well, we we'll call it adioactivity. Yeah, adioactivity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you look in the instructor's manual of the college book, I talk about that little story. Peter and his, his daughters were in Hilo, and we were talking about... In Hilo, there's a great phobia against uh, irradiating food. See? When the astronauts go up, they don't want to get turista, do they? So what do they do? They irradiate the food, right? Well, in, 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 in Hilo, we grow papayas and mangoes and things like that, and we can't ship them over because uh, they, they, they might have bugs in them. So we can irradiate them and ship them, but no. The citizenry is against it. No food that's been contaminated with radiation for my children, thank you. And so the industry can't, can't make it. Radiation is the big bad word today. Question? Well, no, just a comment. You notice what the medical people did with nuclear magnetic resonance. Nuclear magnetic resonance. Magnetic. Nuclear? Not for my Aunt Minnie. <laughs> so we changed the word to? Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, that's right. Nuclear is a naughty word, too. Radiation is a naughty word, too. And we all know what radiation is. Radiation is something that was produced by those scientists back in World War II <laughs> when they made the atom bomb. And there, ever since then, we've had radiation. Isn't that right? And we want to keep away from radiation at all costs, right? And we plug a Geiger counter in, we find that darn thing seems to be ticking all the time, doesn't it? Okay. Well, maybe that's a little defect of the machine, huh? Yeah. That Geiger counter is ticking all the time. And we all know that we're all radioactive. Oh, do you know what you're eating, my dear? Hold that up. Hold that radioactive. up. That's, radi that's radioactive. Put a Geiger counter in, it will sink. And the concrete blocks and the, 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 the granite, there's enough radioactivity in a hunk of granite that if you could thermally isolate it, it would melt in 12 million years. There's enough uranium, potassium, and just ordinary granite. It's, it's everywhere. It's in us. It's the carbon-14. It's in everything we eat. It's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's radioactivity has been around a long, long time. So we want to talk a little bit about that now. And this is something we never talk about in our courses, do we? Because what part of the course does it fall in? What part of the book is it in? And, and you're too busy doing kinematics experiments, right? <laughs> <laughs> and next time, question? She bathes in the warmth of a natural hot spring in the quiet and peaceful natural mountains. The spring water is warmed by, and what's the answer, gang? By nuclear power. Yeah, what is the Earth's natural heat? What causes the natural heat? See? It's yeah, it's natural. One, Big pardon? The students always pick B. Oh, they pick B, yeah. The Earth's natural heat. And that's a good enough answer. But not in a physics class. In a physics class, so what do you mean by natural? And we'll look at that. See? It's not the only source of heat. When the, when the plates are coming down and rubbing in, there's friction generated too there. But the primary source at least by the geology community, is radioactivity. Otherwise, the world would have cooled off by now, and it wouldn't be five billion years old like we find it to be. What does radioactive decay of uranium to lead have to do with the gas in the child's balloon? What is that gas? Helium. helium. Where did the helium come from? We mined it. You get it from down below. No helium in the atmosphere. We talked about that. It's going too fast. So it's mined from below. And where does it come from down below? Radioactive decay. What's one of the products? Uh, what, what, are the two, what are the two particles that are emitted by radioactive substances? Alpha particles, the helium nucleus, and beta particles, the electrons that circle the nucleus. <laughs> so both the alpha and the beta particles, boom, the kid's balloon. Tell parents that. Tell parents that that gas in the balloon is radioactive debris. Whoop, the balloon sails would go down. Yeah. That was with the wrong terminology. It's debris of radioactivity. It's not radioactive debris. Ah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's not, yeah, not radioactive debris. Excellent, thank you. It's the debris from radioactivity. I'm going to jump ahead. Jump ahead to finding the mass of atoms. We find the mass of atoms by directing the atoms through a mass spectrograph. 
What page do you have the max spectrograph in your book? Whoever finds it first gets an A. <laughs> Who's got the page? Oh, never mind, then I got it. It's page 637. <laughs> All right, and the mass spectrograph is really wild, isn't it? I mean, you, you, you direct these particles down into the magnetic field, and you do that with a velocity selector, an electric field and a magnetic field crossed, so that the particle that, that does reach the entrance slit has one particular velocity. So one knows the velocity of those particles going through there. And that's a nice calculation to do in, a little, in this next step course up. But then the particles whip in the magnetic field and follow circular paths. And the ones with the greatest mass uh, they take the smaller paths, and the ones with the least mass take a, a wider radius of curvature. And what happens is these things all hit this piece of photographic film and give you then a nice spread of atoms by virtue of how massive they are. So we can distinguish between isotopes. And that's nice. This is a way that we can fi figure out what the masses of atoms are, atomic nuclei. Very nice. And if we graph that, if we make a graph, of mass versus atomic number, we'll get a graph that goes something like this. Anyone surprised about that? All, all we're saying is that if you go higher and higher in the periodic table, the masses of the atoms get more and more. And it turns out there's a little curve here because it turns out as you get higher in the periodic table, you have more neutrons. And we've already talked about the extra neutrons being the nuclear cement that holds those heavy nuclei together because all those positive charges are tending to repel. And so you've got to get the, the glue of the nuclear attraction, and so you get a neutron rich for heavy elements, and so we get a curve. But this is not a curve that you'd go home and, 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 and talk about at the supper table. It's not that big a deal. All this says is the higher the atomic number, like uranium, has more mass than, say, iron. And iron has more mass than, say, aluminum. And aluminum has more mass than, say, helium. No big deal. But here's a big deal. If you instead make a plot of not mass per atomic number, but mass per nucleon. Mass per nucleon. And you can get the mass per nucleon by taking the mass and dividing it by the number of nucleons. If all the people in this room get on a scale and we get a combined weight, I would take that weight and divide it by the number of people in the room, and I would have the weight per person, average. And you can do that with elements. And the scientist types do that with elements. And when you make a graph of mass per nucleon versus atomic number, in the old days it would, thought, it would be thought that you might have a graph that would be like that. We talked before about the idea of mass being invariant. How much mass a particle has doesn't change if the particle is moving, or it doesn't change looked at different frames of reference. And so we kind of have that idea. And it might seem that the mass of a proton, for example, or a neutron, ought to be the same in one element as compared to any other element. But it turns out that's not the case. And the graph we get is rather intriguing. If you were to make that graph, it would look something like that. What that means is, see all the elements I have on the table here? Notice the nuclei, hydrogen, helium, lithium. What's the next one, boron? Oh, beryllium, or no, boron, I guess. They keep going up, da, 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 da. And over here, uranium, lead and gold and mercury in here. See all those elements? What I'm going to do is I'm going to perform a thought experiment. I'm going to take the nucleons of those elements and shake them. I'll grab the proton and I can get a, a feeling for how much mass it has, how much resistance to, to a change in motion. Now I come into the helium and grab one of them, and oh, it's easier to shake. That's interesting. Go back to the hydrogen. Harder to shake. 
helium easier. Hmm. Lithium, even easier still. And I find out that the nucleons are easier to shake as I progress up. I get up to iron, very easy compared to the hydrogen. And now we're here on the graph. And then beyond the iron, I find out the nucleons are harder and harder to shake. For some reason, there's more mass for a nucleon as I go up the periodic table. And I look at iron, and I say, hey, iron, <laughs> your nucleons, least massive of all. And the iron says, oh, yeah, that's right. Try pulling one of them out. And I try to pull an iron nucleus from the, a nucleon from the nucleus. And I find it requires more energy than anywhere else. Iron says, I might not have much mass per nucleon, but I'm bound together with more energy than any of the other nucleons on the whole periodic table. And that's what you have. You'll find in most textbooks, this is a graph of binding energy versus atomic number, which is the mirror image of this. And most all textbooks do that. I think it's better to couch this whole thing in terms of this. This is something our students are familiar with. They've heard this. And what I'm going to argue here is that the energy I get off in a reaction will be at the expense of the mass that's the, the mass defect. So what that means, well, in, in fact, you can kind of look at this this way. And the textbook talks about this. Take a nucleon in there, OK? Now, try to pull it out. When you pull it out, are you doing work on it? You're doing work on it. Now you bring it outside. Has it got more energy out here than it had over here? It has more mass out here than it has over there. And that, energy, that potential energy is manifest by having more mass. <laughs> Plunk it back in, whoop, now it's together. It takes energy to take these things out. And when you take them out, they have more mass. You look at the, the proton over here by itself. No binding energy, not bound to anything. All its essence is just its inertia. And so you get a graph that's like this. And here we have atomic number 26. So over here, start with 1 and come up here maybe to 92. Now we can talk about nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, and how it is that we get energy from these reactions. I can put a little dotted line here. And we all know that in nuclear fission, what happens is a heavy nucleus, somehow or other, Boom, divides. And when it divides, we say it fissions, divides into uh, roughly equal pieces. O ordinarily, nuclei will spit out an alpha particle or a beta particle, and we have these small changes in energy. But in this particular case, nuclear fission, a whole new ball game. Now let's look at what happens. Have a uranium atom. Let's see how much mass it has per nucleon. Quite a bit. Now, the, the uranium nucleus fissions into two others down here, say me down here, down here. Look at the mass per nucleon over here. Mass per nucleon here. Less mass. We say there's a mass defect. We say that after the reaction, if you take the masses of all the fragments, they won't add up to the mass that you had to begin with. So some of your mass is not there anymore. That's the energy you get off. And for uranium atom, it's typically 200 million electron volts. I don't write. It's not so impressive to a non-science student. This is more impressive, especially when I compare it to like the energy that uh, Niagara Falls gives to the, to, to, to the water drops going over Niagara Falls, which is four electron volts. Or I talk about the energy that happens when, oct when, when gasoline oxidizes, which is what, about 30 electron volts. And now I'm talking about the energy of one atom of uranium fissioning, 200 million electron volts. And you know what? If you find out the mass defect of these, multiplied by c squared, you'll get the 200 million electron volts. So energy is produced when you lose mass. In fact, I like to say the name of the game for energy production is have less mass after the reaction than you had before. You get the same number of particles. You get the same number of nucleons. 
you get the same amount of charge, but you have a different amount of inertia. You have the same amount of inertia and energy mixed together, but you convert inertia into boom, energy. And that's the energy that's given off with nuclear fission. One way to look at it. How about nuclear fusion? Nuclear fusion is welding together light nuclei and getting energy off, or welding together any nuclei and getting energy. And it, well, you may or may not get energy off of the reaction. And we can see why hydrogen will give you energy. You have a couple of hydrogen atoms, nuclei. If you somehow fuse them together to become helium, in the helium state, they'll have less mass per nucleon than was the case with the hydrogens. So take a pound of hydrogen, take a pound of hydrogen, <coughs> fuse it, you get less than two pounds of helium. Some of that mass isn't there anymore. We call that the mass defect. Take that mass defect, multiply it by the speed of light squared, and you have the energy that comes off. And it's typically something like 24 million electron volts. Not as much per reaction, but more per pound. Get a lot more atoms in a pound of uh, hydrogen than you will in a pound of uranium. So very, very energetic reaction. And of course, the sun shines with the energy that's produced by this process. Now we can ask questions like this. Well, what if I took some lithium? If I could fuse a couple of lithium nuclei, would any energy be liberated? Check your neighbor. I've never heard of the, fu the fusion of lithium, have you? I've never heard about it. But do we know enough? Do we know the rules of the game whereby we could predict whether or not if it did fuse, there would be energy given off? Looks like lithium's the third element in the periodic table gang. Looks like lithium's right here. Okay? And if you take a couple and fuse them together, what will it be? Three and three is what? Six. What's six? Isn't that carbon? Carbon's over here. So it looks like you'll lose mass. It looks like you'll have less mass afterward than you had before. That's going to give energy off. How about we take a couple of gold atoms and we fuse them? What's going to happen? The two golds are going to be way up here. Hey, you're going to have more energy afterwards. That's going to, that's going to suck in energy. Let's suppose we take iron at the bottom. Let's suppose it's the future. And you've got some fuel. You're coming down the street. And you've got a wheelbarrow full of iron. And you're going to bring it to the nuclear plant. And you've got two plants. You've got a fission plant over here, and you've got a fusion plant over here. Which plant should you bring it to to sell so that you can get nuclear power? Which one? <laughs> None. Neither one. Because if you fuse it, you're going to run up the hill. If you fission it, you're going to run up the hill. No matter what you do, it's like the four degree bit with the, with the water freezing, you know. No matter which way you go, you're going to increase in mass. So iron is the nuclear sink. And why is it when we're studying astronomy, we find out the fusion process can keep happening in the stars as they can go up, and when they get up to iron, that's the dead end. What happens when you fuse iron atoms in a, in a nuclear fusion reaction? What happens? Does it give off energy? It sucks it in and your star cools down and you, the process runs out. So iron's the end. Where are all these elements, by the way, manufactured? In supernova explosions, not in the fusion formations in growing stars. So all, in fact, these elements over here are very, very rare compared to these. Most of the matter in the universe is all here, produced in stars. Some of the matter in the universe is produced by supernova explosions, and who knows what else? We're finding more and more all the time. But I find using this graph is a nice way to show how fission and fusion both produce energy. And the name of the game is get a mass defect, have less mass afterwards than before. Isn't this true in chemistry? If the reaction is going to give off energy, you've got to have less mass in your products. If you have more mass in your products, it's going to take in energy. And I just want to emphasize this way of looking at this curve that you often see in your other books upside down as a binding energy curve. I think this is more conceptual.
This is an important one, gang. I didn't know this for years. Check your neighbor. When a uranium nucleus undergoes fission into a couple of fragments down here, there's a mass defect which multiplied by the speed of light will give you a value 200 million electron volts. How is that 200 million electron volts manifest? What form? Gamma radiation? Kinetic energy of the neutrons? Kinetic energy of the fission fragments? Heat? or each of these about equally. Check with your neighbor and your neighbor would tell you their opinion which would be what? How many say gamma radiation? Dun, 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 dun. How many say kinetic energy of the neutrons? Dun, 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 dun. How many say kinetic energy of the fission fragments? Dun, 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 dun. How many say heat? What do you mean by heat? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean by heat? Define that. Billiard ball physics, gang. How many say each about equally? Yay. OK, and we find. How about I don't show you? No. Answer. Some energy in the form of gamma rays, some in the kinetic energy of the emitted neutrons, but most of the energy of nuclear fission is in the kinetic energy of the fission fragments. The positively charged fragments repel each other and fly apart at high speed. Soon their energy is shared among many atoms as internal energy. It then spreads as heat. Ain't that something? There's our kinetic energy again. Very, very important that energy be a theme of your course. And here we find it's nothing more than one half mv squared, gang. And those things are moving at that energy, and that's the energy that cooks the water and turns the water to steam and hits the paddle wheel and gives us nuclear power. Good old kinetic energy. Ain't that a gas? Now the question at the bottom says, in what form is energy released in nuclear fusion? Ah, nuclear fusion. You got a couple of hydrogen isotopes, mash them together, boom. It turns out the helium that they become has less mass than they had before. Take that difference in mass, multiply it by the speed of uh, light squared, and you get that 24 million electron volts, or give or take whatever particular reaction. And that's the score sheet, huh? Now, what's the mechanism for nuclear fusion? And we come up with one like this. Both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion release enormous energy. When a uranium nucleus fissions, the released energy is mainly kinetic energy of repelling fragments. Good. When a pair of hydrogen isotopes fuse, the energy initially released is in the form of, and we have the same choices all over again. Gamma radiation, kinetic energy of recoiling particles, potential energy of the helium nucleus that's formed, Heat, a combination of all the above. And here we have a hydrogen isotope, deuterium, deuterium, and that will turn out to be helium isotope, helium-3, plus a neutron, and plus there's our energy, huh? And, uh, oh, I said uh, 24, looks like over here, oh, these, neither of these are 24. You get different reactions for different isotopes. But here we have a 3.26 MeV and a 17.6 MeV. Well, how about again? Check, check that one. Where, where, what's the mechanism for that energy release? What's carrying that energy? Gamma radiation? I'm not sure what you mean by potential energy of the helium nucleus. Oh, isn't that a nice one? The potential energy of the helium nucleus. Isn't that an arm waver? <laughs> oh, how about heat? Uh, heat's a real arm waver. Oh, it's all in heat, gang. You know you go into your labs, what's your source of error? Friction, friction. Yep, I got it right. Come on, come on. Give us the friction. What interacts with what? That's what I want to know, right? That's what you do in your labs. 
So when you say friction and heat, okay, those are beginnings, but let's get underneath. What do you mean by that? What interacts with what? What's the mechanism for that reaction? And what's the mechanism for that energy being carried away? And that makes the star shine, doesn't it? And in tomorrow's reactors, that will make the water boil, and the water will boil, and we'll put that through a turbine and have electricity that way too, huh? One way to do it. Well, you've all got a guess there? You've all got a guesstimate? The answer is B, kinetic energy of recoiling particles. Isn't that nice? Kinetic energy again. The energy initially and typically, typically released in the fusion of hydrogen isotopes is divided between the kinetic energy of the two particles produced, a helium nucleus and a neutron. Interestingly, a pair of hydrogen isotopes can't fuse to produce a lone helium nucleus, even though the numbers of protons and neutrons add up correctly. Why? Momentum and energy conservation. If a lone helium nucleus flies away after the reaction, it adds momentum that wasn't there before. Or if it remains motionless, there's no mechanism for energy release. So it can't move and it can't sit still. Here's the punchline. A fusion reaction requires the creation of at least two particles to share the released energy. If that doesn't happen, the reaction won't occur. Or in some cases, like in the dense core of the sun, a neighboring nucleus to take up some of the energy. And the little girl is saying, fusion in the sun involves more complicated and slower reactions where a small part of the energy also appears in the form of gamma rays and neutrinos. But most of it, gang, is in those neutrons. I remember one time I was over at UC Berkeley and there were some high energy physicist types talking. And they were saying something about, well, the reaction won't occur because there's no particles to carry the energy. And I didn't know what they were talking about. They were talking about fusion. Because there was one time we had this hopes that fusion by this time would be the, the fuel that would power us into the next century. And they were talking about there's no particles to carry the reaction, to carry the energy. And I didn't know what they were talking about. It puzzled me for a long time. And I've conferred with a lot of high, high, high physics types that, on this. And this has been through a lot of refereeing. And son of a gun, the energy is carried away by the neutron. And so you notice they're all, oh, notice the reactions involve uh, isotopes where you have a neutron popping out afterwards. And when you look in your nuclear physics books, you'll always notice that there's a neutron. If there's any, well, if there's no neutron, it won't happen. It won't happen, it can't. So there's always that extra neutron, and that neutron is the main carrier of the energy. Of course, this Roy coils from this, and you can do a conservation momentum exercise to see how much, how, how much speed that will have compared to this, and then what energy it will have compared to that. And you'll find that most of the kinetic energy is in the neutron. And the neutron is what cooks the water and gives you your power. So ain't that nice, those high-speed neutrons, you better get them. If you don't, some people say, well, let's have a fusion reaction where we don't have all those high-speed neutrons. Oh, yeah? Stand up. I want to see what you look like. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, Karen. <laughs> yeah. um, recoiling threw me off a little bit there because there's no uh, Coulomb repulsion going on in this case. No, no, no Coulomb repulsion at all. No. So is it possible that the, the, the nucleus that's formed and the neutron yeah. will not recoil, but will just speed off and maybe power? Oh, no, 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 no. One's going to go, one, one, one take a gun and fire the bullet, and it recoils. So unless you have recoil this, then the gas is going out. Right. No, momentum, momentum conservation reigns at the nuclear level. Energy conservation reigns at the nuclear level. <clears throat> so when we teach these ideas about momentum conservation and energy conservation, First of all, maybe in mechanics, hey, that goes along with the rest of the full physics package. Electricity, magnetism, heat, nuclear physics. So those are the foundation principles, and when you're teaching physics, that's why you want to emphasize those. Momentum conservation, energy conservation. Those will apply across the board. And so emphasis on those concepts is well-deserved because they're the, they're the foundation of, of physics as we know it. Yum yum stuff? Mm -hmm. 
Took me a long time to get this straight myself. We keep learning and we keep learning. I think at this point I want to show you some more next time questions that I wasn't able to fit in the course. And then I want to conclude with a demo I think that will knock your socks off. This one has been published. In fact, this is in the next time question book. Okay. So she pushes the book. I push the book against the table. Now, which way is friction acting? Yeah, up or down? Which way is it acting? Down. Which way is it acting? Up. Which way is it acting? Not at all. Can you see that? It's ambiguous. If I push straight across, friction's got to be acting up. A free body diagram will show what? Mg, nor uh, 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 normal, my push, and there'll have to be a friction acting up. Free body diagrams, mm, you got to do those, emphasize those. And of course, that's shown. And note over here, if she pushes just a little bit, then the, the it'll, book will tend to slide down and the friction will act up. If she, push, if she pushes too hard on it, the book would tend to slide up so the friction would act down. Notice the normal force increases. And if she pushes just in between these two, she can push it in such a way there's no friction at all. And that means the horizontal component of this will equal that. That means the friction force plus this component will equal mg. And over here, I think you can see that. Notice that this horizontal force is the same as that. Friction force plus this. Oh, no, friction down plus this will have to equal that. So that, that's kind of a nice one. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. And what's going to be the acceleration at the top? Zero. Yeah, going to be zero. And every single one of us that, uh, that has asked this question to, for the first time, what do we say? Is there anyone here that said G? I want to see what you look like. <laughs> Nobody says G. We all say zero. Come on. You know, but, uh, but if, we, if we let the equation guide our thinking, and what's the equation for acceleration? There's two of them. One is what it is, dv dt, and the other one is how you get it. And that's A over F over A, a is... <coughs> If we let that guide our thinking when we answer the question, are we going to say zero? How can we say zero? The force would have to be zero. There's a gravity force up there. It's weightless at the top. It's like being in orbit. It is weightless at the top. And while it's weightless, there's a gravity force acting on it, OK? Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a gravity, and we get what? mg divided by m, and we get our g, and that's a nice one. But the equation guiding the thinking is the lesson here. Not the fact that, oh, at the top, it's still undergoing a change, which is a nice lesson, too. Here's one of the cases where if you graph this, it becomes evident. Chris? One of the things I always stress with the students is that acceleration is delta v over t, or they take two velocities to find the acceleration. So one of the velocities may be zero, but another one won't be. Ah, that's a nice way to put it. That's very nice. Put it like this. There's two velocities here separated by some time interval. So if you want to say the velocity is zero here at that instant, the student has to agree. That's beautiful. The student has to agree that later on it's got some different velocity. So one of them is zero, but not both. Mm -hmm, I love it. Fantastic. I'm going to put that in my, uh, can I put that in my next uh, teaching guide? There's two ways to do it now. I never, I've been teaching this stuff for 30 years, and I never thought of it that way. Do you guys find that you keep learning new things as you go along, even with the elementary stuff? Thank you, Chris. I love it. A couple of golf balls in a very massive cylindrical cup will balance. Of course, it's stable. Now, if the mass of the cup were suddenly to shrink to zero, the cup of balls would tip clockwise, tip counterclockwise, or remain in stable equilibrium. Now, we got a nice big massive cup there. The cup, boom shrinks to like a paper cup. Check your answer with your neighbor.
ask a non-physics question about this and maybe they can kind of visualize it and see, wow, it's, uh, it's probably going to tip, yeah? Ask a physicist this question. Ask a physicist any mechanics question. And what do they think of automatically just to begin? Kinematics? Newton's laws? Energy? Momentum? Color? Temperature? What usually is the swan screen through and look at as a first approximation? What do you guys think of? Got to be an unbalanced force someplace. To... All right, but it, what at force of New, Newton's laws? Uh -huh. Do that. Anyone have something that's overriding that usually covers the whole darn thing, and it usually will answer most of your questions? Some theorem, perhaps? Energy. Work energy. Work energy theorem. The physicist says, well, <laughs> if you let the mass go to zero, will it take work to tip over, or will it give work to tip over? What's it going to do? What's your answer, by the way, guys? How many say tip this way? How many say no, tip the other way, action, reaction? How many say it'll stay right there? And seeing as it's you, I'll give you the answer. It would take work to tip it over. Try, try it everywhere. Put a couple of cups in a ball. It'll balance. Because the center of mass of the two balls would be right where they touch. And you have a base, even a narrow cup. Ain't that nice? So if you think of these things in terms of the rules, work energy, and then, work, then center of mass, then the problem becomes a... Oh, I didn't understand. I don't answer this question. That means the cup will have no mass, but it will still be there? Yeah, like a paper cup. Oh, okay. I thought that the, the cup will disappear completely. Oh, oh, I see. I see that the cup will go away. Oh, no, they'll just fall over. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, no. no. Let's read it again. If the mass of the cup were to suddenly approach zero... See, we tend to think this is going to balance because it's in a very, very heavy cup. But it will balance because the center of gravity of the system has a support. In this, in, in this, to tip it would, would raise the center of gravity and work would have to be done. So that's the way we analyze it. Yeah, Interestingly I enough... Thinking because I took it as the mass would approach zero so that the cup, the whole thing, will completely disappear. Yes, I'm yes. You, yes, you answered yes. a different question, dear. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I've been thinking maybe, that that maybe happens a lot. People will do it. Oh, I think that hap Oh, I think that's <laughs> prevalent. Oh, I think it's all over the place. I think oftentimes answering the questions that are not asked are at the root of a lot of problems, uh, per in your personal life as well as in your school life. I mean, yeah, <laughs> join the club. <laughs> Paul Tipler told me that his graduate students were fighting about this one, and they had all these computations. I says, my God, Paul, it's the center of gravity work input, work output problem. What's the big deal? I says, can I use it a next time question? He says, yeah. <laughs> they were going bonkers on this thing. Our conceptual students can answer this, can't they? We're talking about stability, whether things lift or does. The book talks about that. Something will tip over if, 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 if the center of gravity lowers on its own. And you're floating down a river, and there's a couple of life preservers, one in front of you and one in back of you and you're floating down the river. And you want to swim to this one or you want to swim to this one. Which one should you swim for, this one or this one, to make the shortest time? And you're all floating together. Turn around and float upstream and grab it, or float downstream and grab it. Or it makes no difference. When this was asked of me, I first thought, well, yeah, I think what I'd do is I'd, I'd, I'd go downstream, because the water's already going that way. I'd swim to that one. I'd just kind of instinctively go to that one, wouldn't you? Which one would you instinctively go to? Upstream. This problem illustrates that problems are often difficult or easy depending upon what frame of reference you choose. To get a grip on this, pretend you're in a swimming pool in a fast-moving ocean liner. If both life preservers are the same distance from you in the, in the pool, swimming toward either would take the same time. 
The speed of the liner through the water makes no difference, just as it makes no difference to people playing shuffleboard or billiards. Can you see that in the flowing river, you're like a person in a pool aboard a moving ocean liner that's swimming toward either preserve. It takes the same time. Ain't that a gas? Ain't that nice? And then little mouse says, if you draw a box around the portion of interest, it will help you to think of it as a moving swimming pool. Choosing a simple frame of reference can greatly simplify a problem. Yum yum or yuck yuck? <laughs> Answer begins with a what? Why <laughs> why? There we go. Now we are ready for this one, gang. Armed with that information, and I asked Cliff mm -hmm. at the physics teacher, publish this one first. And you'll see him called Figuring Physics. And next edition of the book comes out, they'll be called Next Time Questions. Check your neighbor. Suppose you're flying right into a headwind, you turn around and you fly with the wind. In which case does the wind go faster across the top of your airplane wings? This is like the last problem. The airplane doesn't, doesn't care what's happening on the ground below. It's flying in the air, which may or may not be moving. So on a windy day, an airplane, aerodynamics doesn't change. That's a nasty one, isn't it, right? Yeah. Nasty, nasty. Here's a familiar one, round circle. Which can sail faster than wind speed? What's going to happen to the magnitude of that blue force vector as the boat gains speed? Is it going to shrink or is it going to get more? It's going to shrink. And when the boat is going as fast as the wind, the sail will sag. Here's a boat coming at an angle. A little bit for, if I hold the boat steady, that's the force vector. If I hold this steady, that's the force vector. Now I let him go and see what happens. We can see this boat will go in that direction, won't it? Because why? I have components. I have component in that direction, along parallel to the keel that'll propel the boat. And I have another component that's going to tend to tip the boat, so I'll call this tipping component, and let's call that keel component. And this is what sails faster and faster. What happens to K? Let's suppose the wind speed is uh, 10 knots. What happens when the boat's going 10 knots? Over here, the wind speed is 10 knots. What happens when the boat's going 10 knots? Is this still a force? Yeah. Yeah. And so the boat's going to go faster. Can we say that this component, K, will say, stay constant as the boat gains speed? It turns out we can't. As it turns out, the faster the boat goes, pretty soon, instead of the wind coming down like this, the wind starts to, from the boat frame of reference, come like this. And K, indeed, will decrease. Otherwise, you could get this, and a student could say, well, why can't you go to the speed of light? <laughs> There's a little question I like to ask, which is, consider the Queen Mary ocean liner docked at the bay. All right, now we point it out toward the ocean where there's no islands in the way. We rev the engines up, and we get a five Newton net force on the Queen Mary. Five Newtons. That's like, a, like a, a puppy dog bumping against the side, okay, and bouncing off, all right? If we exert that five Newtons against the Queen Mary, net force, what's the ultimate speed of the Queen Mary ocean liner? And you give a multiple choice, and one is toward the speed of light. And what's the correct answer? Toward the speed of light. To say there's a net force is to say there's an acceleration. To say there's an acceleration is to say that there's a 
change in speed if it's straight line. And so it keeps gaining, 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 or, until you're going at relativistic speeds. So Now, I want to show you a demo. I started my course off talking about taking a meter stick and measuring the diameter of the sun. That's kind of nice, wasn't it? How about I take the meter stick and now I measure the wavelength of light? Would you like to see that? Mm -hmm. All right, I can do that for you. How many people are familiar with the equation? Not so many. OK. Well, in my conceptual course, I don't derive that equation. But I can't resist sharing this with you anyway, because in my algebra-based course, I do. And we talk about that. And you have the double slits, and you show that one wavelength is further than the other. And sure enough, this comes out simple trigonometry. I'm not going to derive it for you. Uh, you can drive it yourself. You see it in any textbook. It's common. Okay? It's, the, it's, it's, it's uh, knowing the distance between the, the rules of a diffraction grating, knowing the angle at which diffraction occurs from where it would go if there were no diffraction, take the sine of that angle, multiply it by that d, and that'll give you the wavelength of light. This m is the number of spots of diffraction that you get. First of all, just let me show you some diffraction. OK, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to get diffraction right in that wall right there, OK? See that? Now what I'm going to do, if we had a diffraction grating, I could put it down here. And I could show you the spots would diffract along the ceiling here. OK, see my beam down there, gang? See the beam hitting? All right, now I'm going to put a diffraction grating in here. And see the one up above? Yeah. See? Now there's an angle in there. It's deflected by a certain angle. You put that, take the sine of that angle, multiply that by the distance between these little lines, and that'll give you the wavelength of the light. And m will be 1, because that's the first of the lines. But oftentimes we do that in the lab and we measure the wavelengths of light. Well, you might not have one of these. These diffraction gradients are, are expensive. But what you do have is you all have rulers. And I have a millimeter ruler. And guess what? That's enough to get diffraction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce off the ruler and get reflection. Yeah, I'll try the metal ruler. Ah, there we go. Notice how close they are together, gang. Here's our central, here's our central reflected beam. It's diffracted above and below. Remember before, it came, whoop, it went up on the ceiling. So we've got a very, very small angle here, all right? Now, all I want to do is measure. Oh, I know what D is. D is one millimeter, but not really, because it looks like I'm coming down here at an angle. And can you see, if I see the distances between these and I hold it like that, they're closer together. So my D is going to be squashed up. And uh, let's see how much it's squashed up. My laser is. Five, and over here I get almost 50. It's actually 48. So I get 5 48ths of 1 of 10 to the minus 3 meters for D. Are we clear on that? I'm coming in at an angle like this. So my beam is coming down and reflecting off. So these little marks in here, I see them compressed by 5 48ths. Questions on that? It's not intuitive, I don't think, to see that. Hmm. Well, let's suppose I get these. If I look right down on these marks like this, I'll see them one millimeter apart. If I put my eye over here, I'll see them as occupying 
5 48ths the space, but I still have as many marks per eyeballful. So what I've done is I've cut down the distance between the slits at a grazing angle. Now all I have to do is measure the sine of the angle, and let's see if I get the wavelength of light, OK? I'm going to use the same ruler I used to measure the diameter of the sun. And it looks like over here, I'll take two of them and divide by two. Well, I got five centimeters here. Five divided by two is two and a half. What I'm going to do now is this. Here's my main spot in the first diffracted fringe, went up to here. I took these two and divided by two, so I'll use m as one, and I'll just talk about this distance in here. And that was five, so that would be 2.5 centimeters. Okay, so my sine of my angle is going to be this divided by the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse is going to be the distance to there. Is that right? So my sine is going to be 2.5 centimeters, and the distance from here to there, ah, now let me get this, it's one to here, can some, Peters, come help me? It's one meter there, now bring it out another one, hold, hold it right back, well, right over here, right over here, mm -hmm. okay, there's two meters, high precision, bring it out, Three meters. Stay right there, Peter. It looks like uh, 82. So how many meters was it? 3.82. 3.82. OK, that's the wavelength of the laser light. Who's got a calculator? Calculator for an A. <laughs> ah, here we go. Teresa? <laughs> Brian? What's the wavelength of that helium neon beam, please? Red. And what's the color of red? <laughs> what wavelength? Is it not 6.8 times 10 to the minus 7th meters? Thank you. <laughs> you like that, guys? Yeah. You know who's the first person to do this? Arthur Shallow, the fellow that invented a laser. He came to City College in about 1970 or 72, something, way back then, and he showed this in the room. My God, it was pandemonium. He said, I'm going to never mind a diffraction gradient. I'm going to use this ruler. And we're all thinking, no way. But you don't say that to Arthur Shallow. He did it, and boom, he got it. I forgot about that demo for a long time. This last semester, I'm teaching my, at nighttime, I'm teaching my algebra trig base course. And I started off with the wavelength, of, with finding the diameter of the sun. And at the end of the course, I wanted to get a good demo, because I was really light on demos, because I was poorly prepared. And I thought of this one, but I didn't really have time to test it. So I talked about it with the students, and I had them for two-hour classes. And we set this up and did it like that, and we come out. And it's the first time in my teaching career. Yeah. Applause. They all applauded. Mm. Boy, did I feel good. <laughs> and it came out, I think it was 7, but 7, 6.8, same, same, yeah? But ain't that nice? Ain't that nice? Mm. Mm, so elegant. It's so simple. Uh, the equation, of course, you derive, but if you're into that anyway. Never mind, that. Take the, after you get the diffraction grading gun done, come out and tell your students you're going to bounce it off the little ridges on a millimeter stick. Ain't that nice? I couldn't wait to share that to you, but I figured I'd wait till the last day, because here, we end up with a demo that measures the wavelength of light with a ruler, and we started with the same ruler to measure the diameter of the sun. Anyway, we want to thank you for what's been a very, very wonderful two weeks for us. And we, we, we enjoyed this very much, and we thank you for coming.
said, and I you second that. Yeah. <laughs> and they, yeah. No, no. And we want to thank Peter. And our host, our host, Brian Jackson. All right. <laughs> Woo! Is that better? All right. Okay. All right. That's more like it. Okay. All right. Hey. Hey. Physics. Physics. There we go. Physics. Hey. Yeah.